Good morning, everyone. Thanks and for coming to our October Citizens Water Advocacy Group meeting. Our speaker today is Ed Wolf. The title of his presentation is Decline of Our Shared Aquifer, Why It Matters and What We Might Do About It. Please welcome Ed Wolf. So we'll see how this goes. If each hand can keep track of what the other hand is doing, I might mention briefly how I came to be here. Um, I'm a geologist by training and I spent my career with the USGS and uh, doing geologic mapping and other studies. And um, in the course of that, I got acquainted with a lot of Northern Arizona, including all the way to the Verde, Verde Valley. And when I learned back in 2002 that there was a water, I wasn't a hydrologist, the only liquid that I worked with as a geologist was magma. And I worked with quite a bit of magma erupting, but, but it doesn't have much to do with groundwater. And, and anyway, uh, because I had a pretty fair geologic background, I went to a, a meeting that the Hoys and some others were at as well. And I thought, well, as a geologist who knows something about the geology of the area, maybe I could contribute to this too. So I joined up and was along with the Hoys and others, John Zambrano, who's right there. Uh, I was a part of the original board of Seatbank. So here is a map of the, of the Prescott Active Management Area. The Prescott Active Management Area is one of five uh, active management areas that were uh, defined, designated in the Groundwater Management Act of 1980. And the, the reason was that Arizona wanted federal funding support for the Central Arizona Project, the CAP, which you all know of. And uh, the immediate response, I wasn't in those conversations, by the way. The immediate response apparently was, you got to fix your groundwater problem, Arizona before you're going to get federal support for a pipeline from the Colorado River to Phoenix and Tucson. And, and so these active management areas were designated. And uh, the, there is an officially stated goal for the Prescott Active Management Area, which is to reach what's called safe yield by 2025. 2025 is just a little over five years from now, uh, and you'll see that we've 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 missed the goal. Safe yield meant that as you grow and use water, that you do not change the volume of groundwater stored in your basin in your aquifer. So that 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 was the goal. But it was set as a goal, it wasn't a requirement, and a goal is something that you can say, well, that's a goal, so <laughs> who cares? And, and that's kind of where we are. I'll, I'll have to say, in fairness, I think it was an impossible goal for this particular active management area. Okay, I'm gonna give a talk about groundwater basics for a moment. So this is not a very geologic or hydrologic picture, but I thought it might help some of you who are new to this whole, business with terminology. So this is your household sponge, or maybe it's your mother's household sponge, and it's sitting in a, let's say, in a pan of water, and the bottom, whoop, I get coordinated. The bottom part of the sponge is saturated with water. The upper part, the upper part is relatively dry, for all practical purposes, it's dry. If this were really an aquifer system, there would be the, the water comes into the aquifer from precipitation and streams and so on. And there would be, there would be water here in what's called the unsaturated zone, but it wouldn't be continuous. It wouldn't fill up all the voids. In the lower part, which is a simulation of an aquifer, Every, every void from ones that are too small for you to recognize to these big potholes uh, is, filled, is absolutely filled with water. So all of the empty spaces are full of water and it's called the saturated zone in hydrologic terminology and it's, 
it's essentially what an aquifer is. And I just wanted to get you sort of introduced to what we're talking about here. This is a cartoon of, of a, 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 a valley with an aquifer. It's very much like the valley, the, the basin that we live in. So here is a, a, a valley with a river and uh, the valley is filled with sands and gravels and maybe some lava flows and so on. We can't show all that detail, but it, it's, it contains materials that have a fair amount of void space between grains of sand and gravel, et, et cetera. And, and this part below the water table is saturated with water. This basin sits in a mountain valley. So these are older rocks here and here. They could be granite, they could be almost any kind of solid rock, but if it were an, an analog for RAA, those would probably be granite, and they, the granite does not transmit water well. It works in places if you have your well in granite, if the granite is adequately fractured. And if you get a really long dry period, you may have a spell of, of uh, no water. So, so like the lower part of the sponge, everything from here down in the aquifer, every single pore space has water. It is filled with water. Furthermore, that water is flowing. And in this diagram, it's flowing toward us. Uh, and at this point, the water in the aquifer, the aquifer actually intersects the ground surface. And we have a flowing stream right here because the stream is right at the top of the water table, but it intersects the water table. And so we maintain a year round or perennial river here. That's not the main subject of today's talk, but it is a major issue for, for CWAG with respect to the Verde River. A definition here, an aquifer is a body of water-saturated rock or sediment, water-saturated, that is sufficiently permeable to store or transmit groundwater to wells, springs, or streams. Next slide, Chris, please. So here's a sequence of three slides that illustrates what the effect of a well is on an aquifer system and a river that's flowing nearby. The river or stream is right there. And a brand new well has been put, or a pretty new well has been put into this. Originally, this water table was flat across here and these arrows all pointed in this direction toward, toward the stream. These arrows portray groundwater exiting to the stream. So we put a well in here and very quickly, we got what's called a cone of depression or water's being pumped out of there. And so it lowers the water table right at the position of the well. It redirects the direction of groundwater flow, which was all going this way. So now a part of that groundwater flow is flowing directly to the well. So it changes the dynamics of the system. Next slide. That didn't work. Try it again. Oh, it did? I'm sorry, it's a, go back one. Okay, so I'm sorry, Chris, I apologize. <laughs> so this well has been pumping for a time and, and the water table has declined uh, noticeably. Would you back up one just a sec so we can see that change? Just hit the up arrow. See the difference there? Now the down arrow again, just to let people catch up. Okay, and, and we're actually, um, have, we're now draining water from the stream in the direction of the well. Initially, it was just close to the well that, that flow directions were changed. And so you see, you see that groundwater is beginning to move toward the well. Next one, Chris. And we've gone a little further and here, uh, all as a consequence of this groundwater pumping. Don't think of this as one well, think of this as representing wells in a broader, a broader sense. But the effect here is that the water table has dropped below the stream. The stream no longer flows year round. It carries water after a storm or when there's a snow melt event going on, but it's no longer a perennial stream. And 
the water table is appreciably lower than it was at the outset. Here in the Prescott Active Management Area, we're not so concerned with flowing streams, uh, but we are concerned with the water table. And, and this is just to try to help you understand that. Uh, next slide. Okay, here's a map of the Prescott Active Management Area. The very conspicuous arrows show the direction of groundwater flow within the aquifer system. It's very generalized. The whole area of, of uh, in square miles of the Prescott Active Management is 485 square miles. The white part is the area of the aquifer within, within here. So the edges actually are mountainous blocks. The, the Black Hills, uh, uh, Granite, Granite Mountain is right here. Uh, the Bradshaws down in here. And they're very old rocks that don't transmit water well. And the aquifer is composed of sands and gravels and lava flows uh, and maybe fragmental volcanic deposits and, and so on. Uh, its depth is not very well understood. It's understood in a general way. I think the deepest well that there's a record of is you won't believe it, it's on Deepwell Ranch. And, and it's about, a, I think it's off the top of my head, it's on the order of a thousand feet deep. So the parts of this basin may be a thousand feet deep, other parts are less deep, and there may be some pockets that we don't know about. We have no way to find out unless we drill wells all the way to the bottom. And once you hit a good source of water, you stop drilling, you don't keep drilling just to find out where the bottom of the basin is. So the, the, the dots in here represent the change in water table, the lowering of the water table or change in water level in feet between 1994 and 2004 in a decade. There are a few spots where these red ones are. I, uh, they're a little hard to see here. Uh, the ones that really grab you are these orange ones, which are very abundant up here in Chino Valley, where the loss in elevation of the water table in 10 years is between 15 and 30 feet. And the yellow ones, the loss is between 1 and 15 feet. So we're losing groundwater. The water table is declining. The amount of water in the, little, in the Prescott Active Management Area aquifer is is declining primarily as a result of groundwater pumping. Next, Chris, please. Okay, we're gonna talk about overdraft and here's a definition. Volume of water lost from an aquifer when the volume of water removed exceeds the volume of the water returned. So water gets removed by flowing out of the aquifer into streams as we saw in that, that uh, earlier diagram, uh, it gets removed by pumping. Well, those are the two main things that extract water from, from an aquifer. And in the case of this one, it's virtually only pumping. We don't have any substantial perennial streams that are, are extracting water from the aquifer. So overdraft is when the volume of water lost uh, exceeds the volume of water returned by nature. That water comes from uh, rainfall, snow melt. It primarily comes into the aquifer from streams that of various magnitude. These streams don't have to flow year around. They flow after storms. And some of the water that is flowing in the streams percolates through the stream bed and starts its path down to the aquifer. Next. So we're gonna be talking about acre feet. I don't know whether everybody's got a good mental image of what an acre is. An acre is 43,560 square feet. I'm sure you'll remember that number. An easier way to think of it is that it's approximately the, the area of 90% of the playing field, not the end zone, just the playing field of, of, a, of a football field, a university or, or professional football playing field. An acre foot is, an, is one foot of water covering an acre. So it'd be one 
foot of water covering approximately 44,000 square feet. And it contains, and you won't remember this one either, and I have to look it up, it contains 325,851 gallons, about 326,000 gallons. But you won't need to know that again. That won't be on the hour exam. <laughs> oh, you've got to do it. I can't do it. <laughs> I try. Okay, and this gets us into the subject of, of overdraft. We have no way to overdraft. Remember, it's, it's, it's the loss of water that's in storage in the aquifer. And, and in this case, we think of it as from one year to the next. So we talk about annual overdraft. We don't have an overdraft every year. The, the blue bars represent years. So this goes from 19, this is from the Department of Water Resources. It goes from 1985 through 2015. The blue lines represent the change in water storage, which was a positive change in years when there was sufficient uh, precipitation uh, to actually gain in the aquifer. The orange bars are, represent the years in which the amount of water stored in the aquifer decreased. We pumped out more than was returned to the aquifer. Now you can see a scale on the left is in acre feet. And so um, uh, 2005 was a really good year, winter storm wise. Some of you will remember it, I do. And, and uh, the aquifer actually gained about 16 or 17,000 acre feet of water in that winter. The blue lines in here are mostly represent addition to the aquifer from winter storms. And in general, if we don't have a good winter storm, we're probably gonna lose water from the aquifer. Our winter storms are critical. That isn't to say that the ones during the monsoon season don't count, they do. But most of the blue bars represent years with winter storms. This is the, this is the deficit. The largest deficits are here about 2006 and 2007, um, about 22,000 acre feet gone from the aquifer. Next slide, please. Now this is exactly the same slide, just a little extra annotation on it here. There was some kind of a turning point, I would say that occurred at about between 1995, mid 90s, 1995, 1996, because, and, and this is all the data we got. We have no idea what the storage change was before 1985. So uh, in the period from 1985 to 1995, a period of 11 years, uh, the average overdraft was 2,600 acre feet per year. That sounds like it's something manageable. Well, you could maybe we as a community could manage our water and make up that. But from 1995 onward, or 96 onward, through 2016, which is the last year for which ADWR has calculated the overdraft, the average overdraft was 13,000 acre feet per year, five times the average during the preceding period. So something changed uh, in the mid 1990s. We went from a small, maybe manageable overdraft to totally not manageable overdraft. Next slide. This is just a different portrayal of the same data. The data that you saw initially is right up here. This is the same exactly the same graph except it's been compressed vertically and connected to uh, a line that shows the cumulative overdraft. Each year's overdraft added to the preceding years of overdraft. So we get a picture of total overdraft. So by 2016, the overdraft had reached 310,000 acre feet. And I think that's a knockout. I can 
That's, that's frightening. Um, so we have these same numbers. It averaged up, up, up in this part prior to 1995. That's this part of this cumulative curve. It, it, it went up and it went down. The blues represent periods of addition uh, to water and storage and the um, brownish, yellow brownish ones represent loss of water from storage. So uh, this is startling. The average, the average from here to here is 13,000 acre feet. Next. Now that was the last that we have data. And if we assume that whatever conditions existed since 1995 continue, and if they continue as they were, by 2025, when we're supposed to be at Sayfield, we have an overdraft of approximately 430,000 acre feet. So the, we don't really know what the, the exact amount of storage. One estimate is that there are about 3 million acre feet. So we're not near the bottom yet, but we're certainly getting well on the way. And we'll never, ever see the bottom. If you were ever going to pump the aquifer dry, you'd probably have to have a well every quarter of a mile that went all the way to the bottom of the aquifer. That's hard to imagine. It would look like some kind of a oil field in Southern California. And water doesn't pay as well. Next slide. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Next part of this is some speculation about why the overdraft. Next slide. Okay, so here is a, a diagram that shows the annual pumpage from the Prescott Active Management Area in acre feet. So it's years along the uh, x axis and volume of groundwater extracted from the aquifer along the y axis. And it's actually, I doesn't vary as much as you might think. Um, and one of the things that I hadn't thought about until I started playing with these diagrams is this thing right here. That coincides with the economic downturn of 2008 and 9. And, and it shows up, I dug around, it, it also shows up in the population of Yavapai County. Uh, so there was, a, there was a decrease in population. There was less groundwater being pumped. And so the amount of pumpage moved down. But this doesn't, I'm, I'm, the groundwater pumpage is very much involved in the overdraft, but it's not, it's not the sole cause of the overdraft because I don't see anything in the shape of these things that says, oh my gosh, that looks just like the shape of the overdraft because it doesn't. Next slide. So there's something else that may be going on here. There's some wonderful... Uh, weather service information that you can get in this kind of graphic form. And this is a plot of annual uh, precipitation from 1895 through 20, I think it's through as much of 2019 as we've gone. I don't remember. I can't, I, I did this fairly recently. The yellow line through, the, so this is, this is, each line is precipitation for a year in Yavapai County. It's not the world, it's just Yavapai County. And, and one of the things that strikes me is that there's a, a low precipitation period here that begins in the mid-1990s. I should have said, I put 1996 on every one of these slides just to give you a reference point. Um, I don't know what went on here. It doesn't seem to fit. This was in, in at the turn of the century. Uh, this was this was uh, in the early part of the 1900s. This was the period right here from which the allotments of Colorado River water were made, which were an, an over optimistic view of how much we could get out of the Colorado River. The the yellow line through the data is a 10 year moving average. So it's simply at, at every point in the data, it takes five measures of value, both to the left and to the right of that data point and averages them, and then draws a line through those averages. So it's just a way of smoothing out the data. And you can see 
there's a pretty good dip right there. So it was dry, drier than normal. Next. This is the one that really got my attention. And, and when we had a talk about uh, uh, the weather and maybe climate change in Arizona, there was a diagram like this. This is, this is average annual temperature, again, from 1895 through 2018. And, and we've got this uh, striking and persistent, pretty persistent increase in temperature. It's almost two degrees Fahrenheit in the, in the average in this block right here is almost two degrees Fahrenheit higher than the average of all of this. Now, I'm not gonna get in an argument about climate change. I'm not sure we need to. If you're satisfied that there's no climate change and everything's gonna be better next year and stay that way, we'll just quit the talk right now. So uh, something has happened. It's gone on uh, for a quarter of a century. I don't think this year showed that we are on the verge of something different. And, and I, th I think it bodes ill for the aquifer. Next slide. Okay, so we'll take the overdraft as a, f as, as a fact. I think it's a well-established fact. The future is not a well-established fact. My own opinion is that we're at the beginning of something that is, is going to continue. I don't expect it to end suddenly. Uh, so I'm a voter for, for climate change. Uh, so what happens? What are some of the consequences of this if we can't find some way to mitigate our pumping? Well, wells fail, and we already have wells that have failed. They will, there will be more, uh, and uh, the ones that fail aren't going to come back. They, it, some of them can be deepened. It's not free, but they can be deepened. Some of them can't be deepened. If you've got a well that sits at the edge of the basin that's bottomed in granite, the granite is not very wet. Um, and a consequence of that is that home and business values decrease. This affects, will affect business in our area. And People are going to move elsewhere. Some will decide it, it would be more comfortable to move somewhere, and others will feel they have no choice. Now, that doesn't mean we're all going to move somewhere, but, but we're going to see we've already had people who've had to move, move their homes. They've had to give up their wells, or they have to haul water. Uh, so this has begun. Next slide. Uh, there has been progress to date, and I tried to enumerate some of it. I think we heard about some of it from Leslie. Uh, and the things we're listing here are either done on a voluntary basis, or they have been supported by uh, rebates or graduated billing rates in some communities, but I would be fair to say, especially in Prescott. So rainwater, so some that are working, doing, helping, not solving the whole problem, but they help. Rainwater harvesting for landscape irrigation, low water use, landscaping using, using plants that belong in the Southwest instead of maple trees, um, more efficient appliances, and some reuse or recharge of treated wastewater. And uh, uh, Prescott is, is, does reach, recharge or reuse treated wastewater. Next slide. So we have a group of four municipalities here. Our entire, the entire watershed is, is comprised of the areas of four municipalities and Yavapai County. There are thousands of people who don't live in, the, in one of the municipalities. They get their water from individual exempt wells or from a local water company. And, and so there are really four governmental groups that control the hen house here. Town of Chino Valley, Town of Dewey Humboldt, City of Prescott, Town of Prescott Valley, and Yavapai County. It's a very small part of Yavapai County, but Yavapai County represents the people who live outside of the municipalities. Next slide. 
So w w this is this is just an attempt to try to find we we ought to be trying to find many ways to solve this problem, but this is one that that we might work, and it would be to form a Prescott Active Management Area Regional Water District, and and. What you're seeing, I've just, it comes out of my head. It's not meant to be perfect. It's not meant to be complete. It's a, it's a first sort of thought for me. This water district would represent the four municipalities plus Yavapai County. It would have to represent business, agriculture, homeowners, ecologic concerns, and objective science. Now, you might think of other groups. Those are the ones that came to my mind immediately. And it would be sort of selling our souls to a group to a group like this. Very likely the leaders of this would be elected uh, people who would have have a small number of people who who ran this thing and uh, with public support uh, would uh, uh, work to try to get a grasp on this thing. We're not getting a grasp on it. We have a model right now where each municipality and thousands of individual citizens are all independent operators, and we're not going to solve it that way. Um, next slide. And this is the final slide. When you can't get the machine set up, you get to see where you are in the slides. So, so this this is just a, uh, a thing that talks about some potential local strategies um, for survival. This is local. It doesn't involve directly, excuse me, it doesn't devolve the state or the nation in solving our problem. These are things we can do. They can't all be done without some change in law. Uh, but these are, are things we could take on ourselves. And again, this is not necessarily an exhaustive or critically reviewed list. So one is adoption of universal stringent conservation requirements. It's great that we have a, 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 a city that, that really is working on conservation requirements, but unless we can all work on conservation requirements, we're not going to get there. I don't think we can depend on everybody doing it voluntarily. We got to find a way to uh, make it universally attractive across the active management area. Uh, conversion from septic systems to sewer. This would require additional wastewater treatment plants, permits increased volume of, of reclaimed water, uh, and would include as reasonable. Conversion from exempt wells to managed water delivery systems. The next one, stormwater management that supports aquifer recharge. And uh, along with that, we would need to develop strategically placed infiltration and recovery facilities. And finally, in my list, which isn't necessarily complete, but I've tried to keep it things we could think about on a local basis, purchase of development rights or conservation or conservation easements. Uh, there's one going on in Prescott Valley right now that I've 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 heard about this. And and with respect to uh, open land that's ranch land, it's somebody's land. A common sort of thing is you you find a way to for let's say a rancher you find a way to uh, or farmer you find a way to uh, make a con conservation easement. A common way is you arrange for, for that family and their heirs to live on the piece of land in perpetuity. They have to be paid something to do this, um, but they agree they're not going to turn it into a city. And, uh, and, and, and that's a, an agreement. Now, for the most part, these things aren't free. And I don't know how to, how to say we would finance them. That's not my not my bag. Uh, I think the, uh, the writing, handwriting on the wall is we either take this problem on. I don't think we can take it on as 
four cities and 12,000 or whatever the number is of uh, individuals or families who live outside of municipalities, we're not going to get there that way. We have to, we have to, we have to work as a group. Uh, I say it might require legal change, one of the kinds of change if we talk about um, uh, stormwater management. There are kinds of stormwater management that we can do. There are other forms. If you, we cannot take water. It's against the law for us to take water from an established natural drainage. Once it's in a natural drainage, it's, it's water that is already appropriated primarily to the Salt River Project. Uh, and I don't criticize the Salt River projects. They really were in the area first, and that's the way our water law works. Uh, but there have to be changes. And, and if we, we can take water, and we've got an expert on this whole idea sitting right there, Doug, uh, we can take water that from streets, from rooftops, from parking lots, that kind of thing. Uh, uh, we can capture, treat it, we can return it to the groundwater or, or use it if we can get it clean enough. Anyway, there are, there are costs to do this in the wholesale way that it probably will need to be done. We're gonna, there's going to have to be some legal change. And in this particular case, SRP is going to be the main objector. So I guess I'm ready to turn it over to questions. I just think we're not going to be we're not going to be living here a hundred years from now in any case. But our grandchildren, we would like to think our grandchildren or our great grandchildren uh, will be able to live here, and they may not unless we grab this bull by the horns. Am I on now? Now I'm on. Two questions. One is, do you know if the if the County Board of Supervisors uh, has issued support for Prescott's proposed changes in their water policy? That's question one. And the second question is, are you, you familiar whether any um, well permits have been given? <clears throat> Excuse me like they have over in the Coconino uh, Aquifer to drill for, to do fracking and drill for, um, for well, there's something else there. Oil or gas? There's something else that, um, helium, they're starting to drill for helium. Um, and, the, you know, fracking requires lots of water. So that's a piece that might be a piece of the puzzle. Well, I, so let me, the first one, Oh, does the Avapai County, uh, is, I, I'm going to guess, we've got two Prescott Council members here. I'll, I can say what I think. I'd be glad to be corrected. But I don't think the Avapai County has a role in decisions that, that the city of Prescott makes with respect to water management. I frequently uh, speak with the supervisors of Yavapai County. Yesterday I had a conversation with Dave Williams, their community development director, uh, they have not taken any position on the water policy that Prescott's considering. Okay. You want to talk? Oh, I, I've got a second answer for the first question. Let me uh, let me ask Mr. Lamerson here to comment on this whole deal. I would confer with uh, Councilman Good, uh, concur that uh, we haven't heard anything specific from the county, but I do not think it's a good idea for the city to encourage growth in the county without at least having conversation with the county using our water. Thank you, Jim. And could you repeat your second question? It was about the drilling. Do we know of any oh, drills for I helium? Got it. I or? got it. Thank you for the reminder. So. Um, I'm not aware of any oil and gas kind of, of drilling. I think in the distant past, there have been some exploratory wells. I don't think they found anything. I don't know why the deep well well is a thousand feet deep. It may have been an exploration well. I don't know the answer to that, but 
that, that it's the only if it's a wa water well, it's probably the only one that's anywhere near that deep. And I mean, most of them are a few hundreds uh, at the at the outside. Uh, so I, I I don't I don't see anything going on in terms of oil or gas or fracking, uh, and probably not helium. But I. I I don't know the answer to that. Next. I'll get to you. There's a one, two, three. Uh, I live near Prescott and I have a well on my property. Uh, I, I have no way of determining how much water it pumps. Um, can you speak a little bit about the exempt wells that that exists in the, the region? I'll, I'll tell you what I know. I, I don't know the number. I should know the number, but it's thousands. It's not about 12,000. 12, um, I don't think it requires much more than a permit from the Department of Water Resources. There is a, uh, a statement of legal maximum amount of pumping is 35 gallons a minute. If I remember, the, uh, I think that comes to about 56 acre feet per year. I don't know where anybody on a two acre piece of land would put 56 acre feet of water. So, so it's, uh, it seems to me is, is, it's, it's a bit of a nonsense restriction. I think other than that, they are ungoverned. Uh, I'm getting you. Don't think that's part of the uh, outflow issue, the overdraft. Issue. Oh, and absolutely is. It's 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 removing water from the aquifer, and we've got thousands of wells removing water from the aquifer at at rates that are far smaller than that fifty six acre feet per year. I don't know what you pump is probably not even an acre foot, but. There are many, many, many of these uh, exempt wells, and they're a part of the problem. Yeah, Nancy Steele, and again with Friends of the Verde River. And thank you, Ed, for for proposing this solution. It's it's excellent. Um, I'm recently of Los Angeles, and California has been spending about 15 years working on this um, integrated regional water management. And I was a participant in one of those projects in Los Angeles County and for about 10 years. And it was not easy. Um, it was very difficult. Uh, it was sweetened by the state providing a good amount of money for these groups to operate. So without money right away, you have a difficult time. You'll have a difficult time. But I think the the need to get a handle on the water issue perhaps will be the the, the carrot and the stick that will help this kind of a process go forward. And I'd love to talk to you more about my experience in that. But I do have a question. Mm -hmm. um, I So I'm on the other side of the mountain. And what we share in this county and what we share between the Prescott uh, AMA and the Verde Valley is the Verde River, of course, and the impact of the groundwater overdrafting on on the Verde River, and so I won't I won't talk about that because um, you didn't present any data, and and I think the perhaps that's you've had talks on in the past, or perhaps we can have discussions about that in the future. But what I I think in terms of watersheds and where the water goes and where it comes from in the land that feeds those waters. And there have been discussions that I've been hearing that perhaps after the 2020 census, the population in Yavapai County will be enough to split the counties, basically along Mingus, which would also split the watershed and would reduce our, I think would reduce our incentive to work together. So I guess I'd like your thought about that, about the incentives to work together, because the AMA was, I think, poorly drawn based on the reality of, of the watersheds and the groundwater pumping. And perhaps you could talk a little bit about maybe how both sides of the mountain, how we can work together around that shared resource. Yeah, so, so I actually uh, spent quite a bit of time over the last few years, not with CWAG, I was one of the founders 
But I got sucked into the Verde Valley to the Verde Watershed Association and then to the Verde River Basin Partnership. So I thought about these things quite a bit. And, and the first thing I would say is that the Prescott Active Management Basin is a really important part of the Verde River watershed, as is the Big Chino Valley. And I don't, my initial reaction is, is I don't think it's a great idea to divorce yourselves from the whole upper part of your groundwater system. Uh, in fact, the Prescott Active Management Area probably two thirds of the Prescott Active Management Area and all of the Big Chino Valley are in the Verde River drainage. They're a part of the Verde River. So I, I don't think it's a great idea to say, okay, well, we're not gonna, we're not gonna deal with this part upstream. I'm appalled that that's, that that's the idea. Uh, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of only trying to think about the future of citizens in the Prescott Active Management Area as a, it's a small piece of, of the whole Verde River Basin. Uh, and it'll be better for the Verde River if we can avoid dewatering our aquifer. Uh, and it'll be a lot better for our the residents of the active management area if we can avoid dewatering our aquifer. So I don't mean to slight the Verde Valley and the two are, are importantly combined. I didn't emphasize, and I should have when I was there, the, there really is a single aquifer system in the Prescott active management area, but it drains in two different directions. It drains to the Verde system from the north up to the north to the Verde system and also drains south to the Agrofria system. And there's a groundwater divide between the two systems that isn't in the same place as the topographic boundary that divides the so-called upper Agrofria ground basin from the, from the uh, Little Chino basin. It's one system and all of us who live in it are drawing water from that system and 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 so this doesn't exclude Pre uh, Prescott Valley it doesn't exclude Dewey Humboldt we're all drawing water from this same pretty small basin and I I don't think that we can afford to sit on our hands and say well you know we can't do anything about it I, I think we have to start doing about it. And I imagine the state might eventually get involved. But if we're passe about it, I don't think the legislatures who come mostly from Maricopa and Pima counties are going to get really upset about what's going on up here in a little part of Yavapai County. And so it's, we've really got to get moving on it. And I'm sure we're going to have to have help. It's going to be expensive, and I don't have the answers to that. The answer will be that within a century, our heirs will have to go somewhere else if we don't do something. Any more? Good morning. My name is Judy Stahl, and I'm running for Arizona State House of Representatives for Legislative District 1, which is all of Yavapai County, except where we got cut out over on the Verde side, and um, northern Maricopa. My question is, what are the agricultural and business aspects that are using high amounts of water? And have we spoken to them? Uh, have, have city leaders or state leaders yet spoken to these large interests about ways that they can give back? And then my second question is, kind of tongue-in-cheek, is there anyone here uh, who was born after 1960? <laughs> Not I. <laughs> uh, so I, in the in the earlier earlier days, I'd say it, ag was the main user of groundwater, 
And that has dropped. Ag use of groundwater within the Prescott Active Management Area has dropped way off. And it's related in a significant fashion to the change from countryside to urban development. And, and, and the total amount of water has changed some, but, but not tremendously. So uh, ag groundwater pumping for ag isn't gone, but it's vastly diminished. I, I don't have numbers on the top of my head. Uh, 2,000 about? Yeah, something like that. It's when you figure that in the in in many of those years since uh, 1996, we've been up to 18,000 acre feet of pumping. Uh, ag isn't the thing that's killing us. I don't. I guess I don't have an answer to that. My mention of business was, if we really have a severe water problem and water and people are leaving, it will affect business. But I, I I'm I'm sure there are businesses that 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 use groundwater, uh, but I'm not ready to give. It's industrial years. Very little, yeah. Commercial, we have, but not industrial. Yeah. you might mention ITC. Yeah, so uh, ITC is, I don't remember what the initials stand for, but it's the uh, name of the outfit that is contemplating uh, building an electrical power project uh, centered in the Big Chino Valley. And, and the idea is to have reservoirs in uh, some hills pretty far up the Big Chino Valley and off on the northeast side of, of Big Chino Valley uh, to fill the upper two of those reservoirs with water pumped from the Big Chino Valley. And, and to have a, an underground uh, pipeline that allows water to be spilled from the upper reservoir to the lower reservoir, driving electrical generators en route. It will use water from the Big Chino Valley. The biggest use is the initial fill. And I'm a little, I haven't refreshed my memory. 27,000. Okay, thank you. Acre feet on the initial on the uh, on, on the initial fill, 27,000 acre feet on the initial fill. That's a one-time event. And subsequently, water will evaporate and from those things and probably seep into the ground. And they'll est the estimate that I've heard is something on the order of 1,000 or 1,200 acre feet per year to um, maintain the water level in these two um, reservoirs. Uh, the, the people, the corporation that's leading the charge, this, this then will generate electricity that will go into a regional electric grid. It may not, well, yeah, but, but that's, that's not really so germane to the water issue. I mean, they're drinking our water. Is that what we're going to say? <laughs> anyway, um, the, the people representing this company have pledged verbally, I don't know whether they've written it, but they say, we, we will not impact the base flow of the Verde River if, if the modeling, and it would have to be the modeling shows that we will impact it, we won't do this. Uh, can you believe an American corporation? <laughs> I, Walt Anderson, John Zambrano, Dave Tuno, and you. Uh, Ed, I was glad you pointed out the, uh, the losses that occur in a system such as uh, evaporation and use by itself. And one of the local strategies that was up on the board here a minute ago was uh, uh, the reclaimed water. Uh, use of reclaimed water. And our councilman, uh, Steve Sishka, was interviewed by Marianne Suttles the other day, yesterday maybe, and he said that if we give water to people in the county, they will get all of that water back, that reclaimed water. This seems to be a persistent myth because we know water gets used before it's reclaimed. And then we have, so there's losses all the way along. Do you have any idea 
on this whole myth of reclaimed water. How much water do we lose over time? It can't be a perpetual motion machine. And so we're gonna lose water through that thing and to claim that all of that water we would get back seems to be a big misnomer. Well, I, I, I can't give you numbers on it. Uh, I agree that when you use water, you, you lose some and you process it and you, you put it back in the ground, uh, you're gonna lose some in the, in, in the process. Nevertheless, I, I think that uh, we could actually return more water to the aquifers than they're getting now by capturing um, r runoff or rainwater from roofs, roads, parking lots. I think it might want to be processed before it goes back to the aquifer, but I think we could substantially increase uh, the water in the aquifer. Whether we can solve the problem that way, I don't know. Doug, you have a thought on that? Can you grab the mic? Certainly help. Yeah, I worked on the uh, Bureau of Reclamation Cyworms Central Yavapai Highlands Water Resource Management Study, and I looked at the amount of runoff we could get on an annual basis from seven di different areas, and it showed, um, you know, uh, water that would definitely help in re uh, improving the water balance in our aquifer the the, uh, the idea is to harvest water that otherwise would have evaporated and get it to key areas where recharge will occur which is mainly uh the ephemeral streams like granite creek and um the lynx creek uh, so it definitely would be uh, helpful thanks hi ed hi. thank you for the talk by the You're way welcome. very very good um, um i have a comment um, on something before, before I get to my main question. On the exempt wells, about 12,000, 13,000, 14,000 exempt wells in the active management area approximately. About 10 years ago, the estimates uh, were that they represented about 14, 15% of the water use in the, um, in the active management area. A lot of assumptions go into that, but that's a rough estimate of, of the effect of exempt wells. Okay, you mentioned um, in terms of the effects of overpumping being that we lose our water supply. Conceptually, you mentioned that streams can go dry. I know from your work that you could talk a little bit about real streams going dry in this area, the real springs being one. I wish you'd comment a little bit about that and then maybe about the possibility of subsidence as the groundwater table drops. So let me take them in reverse order. Uh, because I have to say, I don't know, I don't have information that tells me how serious a threat subsidence in the Prescott Active Management Area really is. Um, the basin isn't terribly deep. It isn't terribly big. I don't know whether there's a subsidence occurs because the groundwater between the grains in the aquifer supports it. You draw it out, you, you get some compression of loss of space uh, where that water used to be. Uh, and and that leads in the Phoenix area and other other places to uh, some fairly substantial ground cracking, subsidence of the ground surface with with cracking of, of, of breaks in the ground surface. I don't know whether that's really a serious problem here. I don't know that we've ever seen. Maybe you know. I don't. I have never heard of an instance of ground breaking uh, as a consequence of groundwater pumping. Potential, but but you know we're probably looking at a basin that's a thousand feet or so deep in its deepest spots, and I think we're dealing with basins that are several thousand feet deep and in the Phoenix area. I don't have a good number for them, but they're they're big and they're deep. Uh, so I, I don't know that it isn't a problem, but I don't know that it will turn into one. Now the other? Del Rio Springs. Also oh, Del, Del Rio Springs. So in 1863, the uh, contingent of US Army arrived here. They actually came to protect, uh, well, they arrived in what is now Chino Valley. And they came to protect miners from being attacked by Indians who were unhappy with the idea of uh, miners being there, I guess is a simple way to put it. And, and um, they 
picked the spot in, in what is now the very northernmost part of the town of Chino Valley, undeveloped part of the town of Chino Valley so far, because there was some magnificent springs there. The, the stream was named or became named Del Rio Wash, and the spring, the spring or springs were known as the Del Rio Springs. In the 60s, the uh, Arizona Department of Water Resources, I think it was the 60s, um, started um, groundwater modeling and they had measurements uh, that had been made of, uh, let me back up. At one point in the early 1900s, Prescott got its water from Del Rio Springs, which is maybe 15 or 20 miles north of, of Prescott and downhill from Prescott. And they pumped water uphill uh, to Prescott for the city's water supply. Uh, that must have been daunting. And I think they finally decided it was too daunting and too expensive. And so that was abandoned. It, it, um, the, the well originally, uh, as modeled by uh, the ADWR, produced on the order of 5,000 acre feet a year or so. I don't remember the number exactly. And in the 1990s, the USGS established a stream gauge just below Del Rio Springs on that wash. The, the winter, I'm sorry, the summer flows are less than one cubic foot per second. They're very small. ADWR many years ago predicted that perennial flow from Del Rio Springs would be gone by 2025. I've looked at that repeatedly over the years and I think they're right on track because the, slow, the, the, the dry season flow, the flows when there's evaporate, evapotranspiration going on are way down below one cubic foot per second there, if I remember correctly. And, and they've just gone steadily downward, heading, heading towards zero. What that means is that, that there will be a part of the year when there's no flow in, in, the, in Del Rio wash. And, uh, but when it rains, there will be flow. I mean, we face the same thing with the Verde River at the Paulden Gauge. We are heading toward a time, unless we find a different way to operate, we're heading toward a time when the low flows, the, the flows maybe right before monsoon season or in this year, uh, essentially almost all the year, are, are so low that, that we are going to have a dry river for some part of, of every year. It'll show up in a measured place uh, down, downstream at uh, the name of the bridge, Perkinsville. Thank you. <laughs> I'm at that age where I have to find those names, uh, and I, I think it's it's an assured thing unless we find some better way to manage our groundwater. I think that um, the development of the Big Chino Water Ranch, if it ever occurs, is going to be devastating for the Upper Verde River. And it, that affects the Verde Valley because it's a part of the flow uh, that makes the river flow in the Verde Valley. Did, is that good enough on Del Rio Springs? Uh, yeah, over here. Uh, a couple of things, if, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, the first has to do with these exempt wells. I think you said there's 12,000 of them. Uh, somebody did. Something guess, like yeah, that. That's the right sort Within of the PRAMA? Yeah. Okay. Now, if those people, if those wells didn't exist, those people would simply be hooked up to a municipal water system, and their water would come from a different well, not their own. But isn't it? The water use would presumably be the same. So what difference does it make so, whether they're on a private well, or not? I think what you're saying is that we can't ever do anything about water use. The water use will only go up. It'll never change. No, we it's not what I'm saying at all. Well, I'm you just are. Saying, you're saying. No, no, no. no, no. See, a person who has a well. Can pump 56 acre feet a year. But do they? No, of course not. Okay. They use about the same amount as if they were hooked up and to the city private, water system. Very likely. Okay, so the real the, the real problem would be that they're not they have a septic system, not 
hooked up to the sewer and therefore the water can't be reclaimed. Yes. That's the real issue. Yes. Okay. So it's not the it's exempt an, well, it's, it's the an, fact that the septic system... Yes. That, okay. That's certainly an issue. Okay. So a second uh, issue was this, um, the recharging of water that you collect from the surface, whether it's rooftops and streets and whatnot. Would it make more sense, once you've got it in your hand, to keep it on the surface and use it for whatever reasons you would use water rather than shove it back underground? Yeah, if, if, if we could do that. We're also concerned, though, I am at least, about I'd like to see the Verde River continue to flow. And so one of the issues is, is how, do we, how do we protect, if not enhance, okay. that groundwater system? If you're using that water that you've collected on the surface for a use that you would otherwise pump water out of the aquifer for, then it's the... I, I think that's just, a very reasonable lie to consider. I have no argument. My name is Joni Greenberg. And my question is, um, you, on your suggestions of what to do, the conservation. I have a friend who, who's lived here for 40 years, and she's always conserved water. And then she finds out that the city has reallocated um, how much water residents get and taken the water that's been saved and given it to development. So there, that's a disincentive for conservation. And how are we going to overcome that? We can't keep building houses and then tell people to save water. I think that's pretty disingenuous. I, I, I don't have any argument with you, but I think we have to evolve beyond the present system. And you're talking about the present system. And I'm suggesting that there has to be a way where all of us, our representatives, can collaborate on, on managing all aspects of water, water use and water recovery. Uh, and I agree what you say is true, but it sounds as if you're making the assumption, the assumption that no matter what you do, Somebody's going to try hard and then realize they've been screwed and we've built a thousand more new homes. And, and that mode of operation has got to change or our grandchildren are going to have to find another place to live. Hi, I'm uh, Stanley Vorse. I have a, uh, uh, a home in uh, Chino Valley. And, could, and could you my... put your hand up? I can't tell. Okay. Oh, great. Right. Okay. <laughs> right. And uh, I'm, I'm concerned uh, that my well that I have, and I, I, you know, my own septic system, if I understand it correctly, the town of Chino Valley has sold uh, water rights th that is being, there's water being pumped out of the little Chino aquifer to Prescott yes. to be used for their water supply. Now that water that's used in that manner is coming out of, my aquifer, let's let's call it that. That you're part of the my, my 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 part of it, right? I have my my one acre, and uh, that water is not being recharged back in to, to the little Chino aquifer. So it almost looks like it's a continual losing process. There is that is that is not a because you said it's downhill from Prescott to Chino Valley, which it is. I, I think it's it's like about what three hundred feet difference. Yeah. Would that not be a better consideration to take effluent from Prescott and recharge the Little Chino Aquifer? Would that not be a well the, the, a, a saleable the, item? It's the answer is a little more complicated, and there are, are certainly arguments. And CWAG has made some pointed out this very dis discrepancy because water we return water to the aquifer near near the Prescott Airport. It's a long way, and it's probably at best, a hundred year trip to get down to where the wells, the city's wells are. And so we're building a water mound here and a water hole there. Uh, but I, this is why I say, I think we've got to design a system that works better in every possible respect. Uh, we ought to be returning water closer to it. Now, let me say this and, uh, I may get corrected, uh, but I'll, I'll offer it at the risk of not being 100% correct. 
Uh, it's my understanding that uh, Prescott definitely returns treated wastewater to the aquifer in through irrigation, I'm sorry, infiltration basins near the airport. And so they are returning water to the aquifer. You could return water to the aquifer for long-term storage, but there also is short-term storage where you pump it, the equivalent out again the next year. And so it's not really representing a, a net gain to the aquifer. But the technology is there, the system works. When I talk about a system like that, I'm talking about with the idea, and it's maybe pie in the sky, but but actually, if not recharge basins, which are what we have near the airport, injection wells, have them strategically located. And and the biggest problem we have in, in uh, undertaking that kind of a system is that it's against the law. And the law has to do with water rights. And SRP is the big gun on the water rights. Now, SRP isn't bad. It really isn't. But it has a commitment made in the early 1900s to deliver water in Maricopa County, and it has to meet that obligation. And I, I think that if we could capture water, some of which might have been in washes or would go into washes and inject it into the groundwater, that water comes out of the groundwater too. And, and I think SRP is very leery of anybody who proposes such a thing, and I don't blame them. And one of the things I think we would have to come to some sort of a meeting of the minds and say, you know, I think this will keep water in the system. It doesn't have to be a negative for SRP in the long run. Uh, but I think SRP is very cautious and, and they are afraid of getting taken advantage of, probably with perfectly good reason. So I'm talking about open-minded people representing our communities and our businesses and so on. How are we going to fix this problem without goring somebody else's cow? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, let's, Chris, Chris. Uh, first of all, thank you for the meeting today. Um, I'm a little, need some clarification on something. I overheard that no matter where we live around here and we have our water supplies, that if Phoenix doesn't have their quota met, like their lakes and everything down there, that they are, they are, it's okay for them to take water from us up here. I've never heard that. I heard that. Didn't we hear that? We heard something. I heard something like that. I was like, I, "How can Phoenix draw I, from I, us?" Okay, I, 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 thank you. I, I'm inclined to say, "Rest easy." Okay, because thank I, you. I, I've never heard of such a thing. <laughs> okay. and in fact, in fact, Arizona water law prohibits, with one notable exception, prohibits transfer of groundwater from one groundwater basin to another. You can't do it without a special uh, exoneration. Thank you. If the big chino occurs, which I'm sure it won't, a significant amount of that water would go to the valley. I've never heard that. I've heard that. That, that water is going to Prescott and Prescott Valley. The water that we pump, that Prescott and Prescott Valley would pump from the big chino water ranch. Hang on, we got some people who lined up here to. Okay. I, I, yes, sir. Hi, I'm David Dome. I'm actually running for Prescott Valley City Council uh, next year as well. Um, I was wondering if there's any any statewide initiatives at this point and how those might impact us. Well, the, the uh, state is beginning the process of assembling its fifth water management plans for the active management areas. And they will work on a plan for this active management area. I'll have to say that they haven't completely finished the fourth management plan for at least one active management area. From what I've read, that's the case. Uh, and and I'm, I'm sure they're going to address uh, these ideas. I, I don't know. I, I don't know what they're going to suggest. I think they're very much aware that we have a serious problem. Uh, and I really, I can't predict the future 
um, more than that, but it's, it's just my personal idea that at least at the outset, we can't expect and count on and do nothing because we count on the state to come in and bail us out. I think we're going to have to at least start it ourselves. And I, as I prepared this talk, I often thought of the uh, little phrase, uh, the gods help those who help themselves. And I, I, I don't know that we can do it all, but I, if, if, if we don't get the ball rolling in a, in a, in, in a system that has potential to be useful, I, I, I don't think we're going to be at the top of somebody's list for, for help. We're a tiny part of the state. I, what's the ratio of Prescott Active Management legislators to legislators from Maricopa and Pima counties? It must be vanishingly small. I don't, I don't, well, I, I don't think they'll undermine us, but I, I'm not optimistic they're going to give us a long-term solution either. Ed, thanks for uh, all this work. Uh, somewhere in your presentation, I distinctly remember seeing climate change. Yes. That's the last we've heard of it today. Well, uh, this isn't, I, I think if I had another hour, I suppose we could discuss it, but, but, but frankly, I think, it's my opinion, that we're seeing climate change. And, uh, and I can't predict any better than anyone else how long this is going to impact us. But I don't think it's going to be over next year or in the next decade. And we're probably more looking at century scale stuff. But I'm not a climatologist, for Pete's sake. He's a geologist. We used to drive the drone together, and he showed me every rock between here and here. <laughs> Explain the history of it. Doug, do you want to speak? And then somebody back here. You had your hand up, and then who else? And then you do. I forgot to mention that uh, only about 2% of our precipitation recharges are aquifer. 98% evapo transpires, and the amount that flows on the surface out of the Prescott AMA is relatively insignificant. It occurs when you have these big flood years like 2005, where it might reach past uh, Perkinsville Road on uh, Granite Creek and then keep flowing, but that's uh, very rare. Uh, so in order to create a true water balance, if we were to harvest water off of primarily urban areas, that otherwise would have been lost to evaporation to create a, a water balance to make up for our deficit, we'd have to capture additional 3% to supplement, supplement nature's 2%. And uh, so I've talked to the water resource, uh, excuse me, water rights manager of uh, SRP, and I've tried to bring it to his attention that, you know, you've, you get very little of your surface water completely coming out of the basin. And if we capture water that otherwise would have evaporated to get a better water balance in our aquifer, that can only help the Upper Verde River and, and SRP uh, downstream because it will continue that hydraulic grade line and flow to the springs. And he acknowledged that, but he says, well, if we put more water in the aquifer, then somebody else will take it. And um, so I just wa also wanted to mention that just if, if you don't mind just a couple of detail things of part pardon me but I'm, I'm an engineer so i tend to go towards details <laughs> but uh talking about the amount of water in the aquifer uh, based on adwr information i calculated about two million acre feet in the upper alluvial and one million in the lower now the upper alluvial is very is not very conductive at all it's very hard to pump water out of it it's we primarily get our water from the lower uh, aquifer that's very conductive and is conductive because it's cracked and fissured. That's called secondary porosity. And when I did my calculation, I assumed 8% uh, uh, porosity, but that's just an assumption. And if you look at the well logs of uh, the city has of their uh, two of their wells, as you go down in depth, it talks about some areas are fractured basalt and some areas that don't even mention that's fractured. So when we talk about uh, pumping more out of our aquifer, there's a managed, there's a managed risk thing involved here. Um, 
just how much water is there really in the lower uh, uh, aquifer? Is it um, 1 million acre feet or is it less? It depends on how much of it is fractured and how much that fracturing is interconnected through the basin. We really don't know, you know. And um, so one last thing is I did calculate based on ADWR uh, data what the flow rate would be in the lower aquifer out by the airport. And based on their data and a very basic hydrogeologic uh, equation, I came up with to go one uh, mile, it would take 10 years. And that's in the lower uh, aquifer. So um, it's true. It's, it's analogous to like if you look at the um, a swimming pool, instead of water, it's like say you have molasses in there and you're taking it out on one corner where you're getting a depression and then you're putting it in the other uh, opposite corner where it's building up and it's just not flowing. So I just wanted to mention those few things, a few details. Thank you. That was Doug McMillan. Uh, my name is Dave Wallace. Um, my question to you related to one of your slides, I was recently in attendance at a uh, community meeting over in Pronghorn Ranch in which the officials from the town of Prescott came and made certain representations related to the depletion. Uh, however, they quantified their, their usage in inches rather than acre feet. Okay, so um, you talked about an annual depletion rate of about 25,000 acre feet, maybe 30,000 acre feet. Um, they talked, to, they framed you it know, in our, our, our the biggest numbers on our overdraft are about 18,000. Okay. Well, okay. The 18, average. Average of 18,000 feet. 13, okay. Um, it was portrayed there. And I, and I only say this for, because of the perception that comes about and people trying to be educated about the thing is that they equated that only in a matter of inches. And therefore, if I, if I view it in terms of inches, you know, it was basically there's more than 100 years. Uh, worth of water if I only look at a half an inch a year or a quarter inch or one inch a year. And, you know, people felt gr a great deal of comfort in saying, wow, if I'm only, I'm not losing 18,000 acre feet, I'm only losing a half an inch. <laughs> okay. And so it kind of goes to as, you know, the, the, the big dilemma that I see represented both publicly is, is, you know, what it, what is, you know, how can this accurately so be depicted? you know, what the true impact is. Inches are very, very small. Acre feet are large. So um, the, one of the first slides that I showed was, uh, early slides, was a map of the AMA with a bunch of colored dots. The orange dots, which were uh, abundant, particularly in the northern part of AMA, represented a decline in 10 years of the water table of 15 to 30, no, 15 to 30, 15 to 30 feet, I think. Um, and I don't know how you, that's a lot of inches. <laughs> 30 feet is 360 I'm, I'm, inches. I'm trying to, you know, just as a citizen, like most people here, I'm just trying to decipher who's telling me that. Well, I, I. The town of Prescott says, hey, you're only talking a fraction of an inch and all you guys are 65 years old. So you don't have to worry. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> well, I mean, those, oh, no, I'm just, yeah. So those water levels are one of the things that you actually can measure. And they are measured in, in monitoring wells. And, and they're measured either by the Department of Water Resources or the USGS. And it's very straightforward. It's uh, the distance between one chair leg and another looks like about, 24 inches, you can measure it. And nobody's going to argue. Nobody's going to say, oh, it's really only an inch. <laughs> I mean, I just, I don't understand. I don't understand what you, whether it's only a part of an inch. I don't know what they're talking about. That's what I'm confused about. Because, and I don't, I don't know um, I, it's just that that's how they're representing the water usage. Well. And, and you know, no, they're not saying, hey, you know, I got well. Well, I... I guess our purpose, our, one of our hopes is to educate the public so those things get challenged and cleared. Hi, Ed. Robert from Chino Valley, uh -huh. and thanks for doing this today. My question is, most of the data seems to be come, coming from the ADWR, so they're aware of the overdraft, obviously. But yet, a developers, or if you drill a well, you have to have a 100-year assured water supply. How are they approving that? 
How are they coming up with a 100-year assured water supply when they approve a well or a development? I guess I don't tell. I don't have an answer. I mean, they they are using ADWR data, I'm sure, and um, and and in, in, in interpreting from uh, ADWR groundwater. Now, I think I, I back. Let me back up. It's a question I hadn't thought about answering, but I think that in that situation, they probably hire a groundwater consultant. And you may or may you may or may not get good sound data, but I think that's what happens. They 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 go to a, a groundwater. If you have a small local water company, for example, that might serve a subdivision. I'm pretty sure the way they prove the hundred year or try to prove the hundred year water supply is to get a report from a groundwater consultant. I, I, I that's what I think. Well. Well, we got to fix it, huh? Um, thank you. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Bill, you want to answer that? The question was, is it how do they figure a hundred year groundwater supply for a developer? Do you know that? The state and approval to build and so on. How do they actually do that? It's in, I can tell you that it's in law, how they do it. It's about, uh, it's all set up to be done according to regulations that the state has set up. It sounds weird, but I mean, they have a way of, of determining, yes, Mr. Developer, you have proven according to our regulations that you have 100 feet. And typically these days it's uh, alternative water, which is what it's been reclaimed, measured, and they can take a shot at it. A developer would have to be able to show they either have acquired uh, water rights to a sufficient number of acre feet to water how many um, single family homes or multifamily homes they plan on developing. So that's one of the contentious areas that Originally, the city of Prescott determined that each individual single family home would use approximately 25 acre feet per year. And then they added a, um, it was 0.25 acre feet per year plus a estimated commercial component that um, a single family home occupant would use, which would be 0.1. So it was 0.35 for many, many years. And then finally, with some of these consultant um, um, studies, we were able to show that the actual usage was around 0.17. So consequently, more homes could have been um, approved during that period of time. And they're using that database now to justify additional development based upon that usage number. N not specifically, no. We're still trying to determine what the commercial actual use is. So uh, that's a separate part of this policy that is very uh, poorly um, justified and it's not quantified either. And that's one of many concerns I have with this proposal. So let's back up just a little bit and simplify it. I think we're talking about, so we're sort of mixing apples and oranges. Here, the city of Prescott is in a different league from a developer out in the county who wants to develop a place for some homes. Um, one of the kinds of uh, places might be, um, um, heck, I just gave it. Anyway, someplace out in, in the county. I think that developer has to, has to show that 100 year supply, it requires that the water table not decline more than a thousand feet in a hundred years, even though the basin might be only 500 feet deep. Uh, but, but the way they do that, and I know in the past, this is the way it's been done. They hire a hydrologic consultant. This person is licensed by the state. It doesn't make him honest, but he's licensed by the state and he prepares a report. And then the Department of Water Resources 
either accepts, uh, they might have some basis for saying, wait, there's a flaw in this report. And maybe that happens. I'm not in that meeting. Uh, but that's kind of the way it works. And they say, okay, you met the requirement. Go for it. So that's different from, from the city of Prescott, which has uh, works with AWR to, ADWR to come up with an allotment of water for the city's use. And then the city is saying, okay, how do we manage it when it comes to building houses in the city? That's a little different from building a subdivision out in the, in the wild. Prescott Valley Development also needs the 100-year water supply before they can I, I, get approved. I, I, so, that must be the case. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you very much. That was very, very informative. Um, I live out in Prescott Valley, and my concern is, as the gentleman stated, our elected representative, well, not elected, our, you know, the city manager, our, our water um, uh, department people are saying a very different singing a very different song than what you are. And uh, also very much counting on the Chino pipeline being built within the next couple of years. So um, how can we, since the, the most important thing that I saw that you pointed to up there is that we need to have some type of a uh, joining of the municipalities in this area to solve this problem. How can we do that? I mean, what is the best thing that we can do um, as citizens to encourage that to happen? I know Phil Good is here, but are there any elected officials from Prescott Valley here? Are there, hope to be. Are there any elected officials from Chino Valley here? So we've got one council person here, two. Well, I think Jim left. Jim left. So, you know, we've got one one council person here from Prescott. So how do we get this message out to the people? I mean, we can all be concerned, but unless we run for office and get elected, we can't do anything about it. So how do we make this yeah, that's a, happen? That's a very good question. And I don't think I am qualified to answer how we'll make it happen. But we have to get the problem into the news to begin with. And I think at this point, that's kind of CWAG's role to make public awareness. I mean, we can't tell the various city councils what to do. We're not in that position. Oh, yes. Yes. But. Uh, And um, I know that as far as the 100-year requirement, part of the issue with the proposal that they met for that development, which is 3,700 homes, um, they got credits for reclaiming water and for storing water for the rest of the city. So I don't know that they actually met the 100-year requirement or what the requirement was, but I know that the part of their approval process was that they got some credits for some of the things that they were doing. Don't forget to join CWAG if you uh, want to get the word out in PV. We we try to talk to PV. It's not easy. What? Right. Yeah, let me repeat that because I've got the mic. The Speakers Bureau that CWAG has will send people anywhere to talk to audiences in PV and Chino Valley everywhere. And that's a good way to introduce citizens out there to what we're doing. Sir. My name is Jim Fortney. Ed, number one, thank you for all the work that you do and for trying to share that with everyone. The comment I'd like to make to the audience, and it's exactly that, it's my opinion, is that we have a big problem understanding the difference between the real status of what our water situation is and what continually is referred to as our paper water. What Ed has spent a tremendous amount of time working on is understanding and defining for you what is the real status of our water supply. And the data that he tried to present this morning illustrates the fact that water supply is going down substantially. 
far in excess of what was ever predicted. What you need to understand is that all of these estimates that are currently used by the municipalities in determining whether they are going to authorize growth or not are in fact all based upon what I consider paper water. 30 years ago, there were some studies made based upon the data that was available at the time as to the rate at which we would utilize water. Some of the estimates that Phil just talked about that were included in that development were how much water does a household use? He just told you that they have numbers now that suggest that their usage number was twice as big as it has turned out to be under current situations. Well, I would like to suggest to you that the estimates of how much water we had were likewise overestimated significantly. And the fact that we were going to use water at the rate that we have, and that's what Ed has tried to explain, was never expected. So when you listen to these arguments from the various organizations, try and keep in your mind clear the difference between what's really happening with our water and what the paper water environment where analysis is done as to whether we're gonna have water 100 years from now or not is based upon old and obsolete data and probably models that need to be updated. I would just uh, add to that that ADWR's model has been updated in more recent time than originally. It's it's uh, no question. I'm sure it could be stand to be updated. They have people who work on that kind of thing. I don't know whether they're working on the next model or not. They they certainly could be. So it's not that this is an ancient model, but models re models are built with human judgment. And we can't guarantee that all human judgment is perfect. They do their best. Uh, my name is Amelia. I'm from Prescott College. To answer your question, I was born in 1999. Um, hello. <laughs> um, and I was just wondering if CWAG does any work to introduce or to formulate environment or comments on environmental impact statements for things such as this pipeline and save the Dells to not necessarily stop the development, but stop them in their tracks in a sense to delay it and possibly come up with a way to rebut it. So, um, the CWAG is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation. It doesn't take political stands. I think um, we have felt, while many of our members are involved in the Granite Dells issue, CWAG itself has expressed concern only with respect to water resources. Uh, where we can deal with the water resource issues. We have no statement from CWAG on issues of aesthetics or morality or, or, what, or all kinds of things that are important uh, to citizens and need to be considered. But we really are pretty assiduous in kind of staying within our, our bounds. And I think that's important to maintain our credibility. Uh, So I, I, we're, we're, we're not political. We don't expect CWAG to be represented in a city council as CWAG. We have members who can be or are city council members, but they, they are not representing CWAG in, the, in, in a city council. I don't know whether I'm getting to the answers to your question or not, but we're pretty careful to do what a 501c3 is expected to do, and that is we, we address issues and try to explain them objectively, uh, but we try to avoid being on political bandwagons. Hi, 
I'm Annie Alexander, and I really appreciate this information. It really helps me. I am, hi, <laughs> I'll start again. Uh, thank you for your information. It's great help. I'm feeling a little thirsty and a little frustrated because I'm not sure how to act. And I want to act in a positive way. And maybe you can simplify it for me. In other words, what you can do to help? Very good. Well, Chris has got a lot of governmental experience. I'm going to ask him to answer that question. <laughs> okay, I'm <laughs> Leslie Hoy, um, CBI board member. I, I already had asked for the uh, microphone because citizen action is really important. Citizen involvement, citizens showing up at the meetings. We send out a calendar once a week with all the water meetings in the area. We do try to send members to every meeting so at least one person is there. It's so important for the public to be at these meetings. And then for our most active members, and if you guys, if anyone here isn't on that list and wants to be, see me afterwards, but I do send a report out usually every Sunday where I share all those notes from all those meetings. Um, I just can't say enough how important it is if you can't do anything else to um, at least show up because that's how CWAG has um, influenced the current water policy talks. Um, we're the ones who pointed out, wait a minute, you can't do this with the groundwater allowance. CWAG is who sent ADWR a letter and said, could you please issue a written opinion on this? So right now, now the city has apparently, I heard, is seeking a written opinion. If, if citizens aren't there, well, we all know what happens. I don't want to cast aspersions on politicians because we have a wonderful one here, Phil Good. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Um, and I talked to somebody is here from the Chino Valley Planning and Zoning Commission who seems like an upstanding person trying to do Robert here. So we, we, we do have people and they need our support. Without our support, it's so hard for our politicians who are good and are principled, like Councilman Lamerson, for instance, um, who's trying now to um, say he's opposed to certain aspects of the proposed water policy. If those people don't have support, if they don't have us at the meetings, it just makes it so much harder for them. So writing letters, sending emails, attending, being in a group, <laughs> we need to have group action. Um, we do have a few Prescott Valley members. If we only had more, maybe we could do more in Prescott Valley. It's such a thankless thing to go to a Prescott Valley council meeting. Be, there's no public comment until everything has already been decided. Um, so I know how, how discouraging that is. But if we're ever going to get anything done, we got to get together and we just got to act. That's all there is to it. I'm going to, we only have a couple of minutes left. I'm going to grab the mic and say something to you as well. Um, I used to be a director for the state of Nebraska. I met with people all over the United States for various reasons, and even in Australia, everybody at every level of government. And citizen, I was really fascinated by citizens trying to be influential because personally, I had never gone to a council meeting, never paid the slightest bit of attention. The mayor of Great Falls, Montana was my employee. I had to let him go. And uh, I never went to a council meeting or anything. So when I started to see citizens, I was the guy behind the microphone, you know, with the big state car out there coming up and talking. And I thought, wow, look at this. And the people who made the difference were informed, like we're trying to do with you, let you know how this water game works. Persistent, like Les. They show up. They actually know what we're talking about, what Phil's talking about, what's happening. And that is, those are the people who get closer and closer and have an influence. CWAG is an advocacy group, persistent persuasion. We want to be there. We'd like to have some influence on the water decisions that are made by showing up, not just to say hi, but to know what's happening because we come to these meetings. Okay? That's how it really works. So, 
Ron, I think we have 30 seconds. I think I'll just say, hey, why don't we adjourn and come on up and talk to Ed if you'd like to, and we'll see you next month.